volgend sê ek vir die personeel, daas woensdag in die universiteit in uh, Amerika herleving wat uitgebreek het. Hulle het begin met een aansessie, een gebedsessie by die, uh, by die universiteit, bykie muziek gespeel, saam uh, bedien en toe begin die dienst aanhou tot ek dink nou toe. Die dienst gaan nog steeds aan. Nadia? Ek weet nie. Nee, dit is saterdag gestop. So, ek, so ver as wat ek weet ook, ja, Amalia sê, ek gaan nog aan. Ja. So, gaan nog steeds aan. So, hulle, hulle sing so'n bykie worship, en dan lees hulle woord, klipaard, en dan bly hulle bid. Wilmar, weet jy van dit? So, um, en dan, da, de, en het bly aanvloei, uh, op die stadium, ek dink toen Nadia vir my die ding gestuur het, toe was het 85 ure aan een, uh, dan stel jezelf voor, die breek haar leving uit, vanavond as Wilmar ons bedien, en uh, ons gaan een paar ure aan, as jylle recht om 85 uur, die partij van jylle moet jou baas bel moore, en ons sal, ons sal, <laughs> ons sal kost moet inkry, uh, ons weet nie wat gaan ons met al die kinders maak, wat by die school moet kom, en alles nie, maar, maar stel jouself voor dit gebeur, dit is nou klomp universiteitsstudent, en ek dink is makkelijker by universiteit as dit daar gebeur, maar ek wil vir julle sê, ons bid vir haar leven, en ons moet recht wees om te sê, ek sê vandag vir die personeel, ons beplan morgen in hierdie lokaal, uh, Valentine's aand, hier is allerhande, kombersies en liekies en kliggies en alles, maar as haar leving vanavond uitbreek, dan deel ons die Valentine's kos vir julle morgen middag uit. <lacht> en dan sê, sorry band, koe baie met die Valentine's eten, en dan nou ons haar leving. Want ons gaan eerder aan die Heere submit as, as aan ons program. En dis wat ons is. Maar ons het de verwachting, ons het de honger, ons het de doors om te sê, Heilige Gees kom, en kom beweeg, net soos wat jy wil. En as ek weet van een ouwe waar hy selle doorset, is het my vriend Wilmar. Kom staan nie voor. Um, hy het so'n mooie hart vir die heren, en uh, so hy gaan ons vanavond bedien oor die heilige geest, en ek wil net vir hom bid. Wilmar, jy het die eer, ten sy die heilige geest dit 85 eere maak, dan sal ons ook krijg. So, heren, dankie vir Wilmar. Dankie dat jy geest dier om werk. Heere, dankie vir die autoriteit wat hy dra, en dat die liefde waarmee hy bedien, ons altyd so sien, en Heere, mag hy weer vanavond, in die liefde van Heere, met die waarheid van die woord, die kracht van die Heilige Gees, kom bedien. Ons eer die Heere Jesus. Amen. Amen. Nou wil maar hier is die gewoonlik, die leiers en die vrijwilliger leiders van die gemeente, en ons praat een bykie visie en so aan, en, uh, maar ek het die hele gemeente uitgenooi en gesê, hoef nie een vrijwilliger te wees, of een leier nie, want vanavond, ja, vanavond, vanavond is een goeie tijd om hier te wees, so dankie, oor nie. Nee, dankie. Wouter, baie, baie dankie, dood, baie dankie vir die voorrecht om hier te wees. Goeie naand allemaal. Um, dit sal die laaste keer wees wat ek in Engels of in Afrikaans praat. Ons gaan, ons gaan as het kan wees in Engels. Um, dit wat ek doen is in Engels, ons net met soveel meer emotie. Dan weet ons ons allemaal vertrouw op die heren, wanneer ons het in Engels doen. Is dit oké? Okay? Great, wonderlijk. Is daar enig iemand wat Engels is? Great. Oké, okay. dit is kaam, kaam. So een of twee wat net so half pad... Ek moet ek het in Engels vraag, nee. Oké. Okay. <laughs> dit sal help. Great. Dit is een baie groot voorig en, en uh, ek vertrouw erg dat die harte vanavond gaan oopwees vir dit wat die Heere wil doen en hoe die Heere net dier ons gaan vloei. So kom ons sing dalk so ietsie saam en dan, dan um, Jakko, ek weet nie, het hulle al vir jou baie geluk gesê met jou verjaarsdag. Hy werk vanavond op sy verjaarsdag, hoor die baie geluk. En mag jy jou baie sien, 
En ek wil graag vraag, het jy soaking music wat jylle hier kan doen ook? Oké, okay, maar kom ons, kom ons worship sy in sang, en dan kan jy ook so bykie op die achtergrond sê, dan, dan begin ons teach, en ons vertrouw die heren vir, vir iets speciaals vanaan. Is dit reg? Great. Ons kan sommer staan, jylle hoef nie so vast te wees in die stoele nie. Dis daarom makkelijk as Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Jylle ken het en uh, ons gaan het sommer net uit ons harte uit. So. Just say that. 
We fix our eyes We fix our eyes on you Only you can do We fix our eyes on you Oh Lord We fix our eyes on you We fix our eyes We fix our eyes on you He's here And Holy Spirit You are welcome here Fill this place And fill the atmosphere Your glory God is what I want Long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord. And we welcome you, Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and do that, what you want to do tonight. And we open our hearts and our spirits. And Father, we pray that you will come and expand our hearts, expand our minds. Expand the way that we think and the way that we see. Because God lifting you up now to a higher standard, to a higher place, to a new level. A new level of faith, a new level of belief, a new level of understanding. He says in His Word that He says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned and to the flesh it's folly. But you are spirit being created in His image and likeness. The desire of his heart and tonight what he wants to tell you is that he wants to get so close so much closer to you and he's gonna he's gonna extend an invitation to you to say yes Lord the question will be are you willing to respond back when God asks thank you Father Thank you, Jesus. You're welcome to just go and be in this atmosphere, but go and sit down. And Man, God wants to expand your mind and the way that you think. And I want to start tonight with this, that I want to tell you, God is in you and He likes being there. Amen? Come on, you can preach with me a little bit. God's in you and and He likes being in you. And we cannot go in faith where we have not gone in intimacy in our lives. God wants to take us to a deeper place, but God calls you. He's He's an intimate God. He's an intimate Father. And He calls us to that place of of depth and intimacy and relationship. You see, even happiness in our lives. Happiness is not just something we chase. Happiness is a relational thing. Because in the day when you're going to die, are you going to fix your life with a who or a what? You see, happiness is about a who, not a what. Because happiness, if it's about a what, then it's like this. You get a phone. The problem with a happy what is what's next, isn't it? Because your phone is getting old and you want then the next best thing. And, and, and that's why happiness will never be in a what. Happiness is in a who. It's like when we were young and you had the right bunch of who's around you, you were happy. doesn't matter what you have. You were happy as long as you had the right bunch of who's. So happiness is about the who, because you're not going to make right with a what. You're not going to say when you die, honey, just bring my shoes. You know, I just need to spend more time with my shoes. I'm not going to say that. You're going to fix it with a person. You're going to say, hey, bring that one, bring that one. You see, happiness, the nature of that is relational. And one of the things about happiness is Jesus, they ask him in Matthew 22, he says, what is the greatest command? He says, out of all the laws we have, what is the greatest one? What will you say? And Jesus says, hey, love God, love your neighbor 
um, as you love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. He says that's first. And he says, and second is like it. Meaning that as important as it is to love God, you have to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And what he's actually saying is, hey, have peace with God. Have peace with your neighbors and have peace with yourself. The nature of happiness is to be at peace, to be in that right relationship. That's why God gives you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen? So, so that's the same. Intimacy, the nature of that is relational. Happiness, your peace is a relational thing in your life. And, and what we want is we want to become ministers in the Spirit. Galatians says, he who ministers the Spirit among you works miracles. You see? And we all have that desire. Who of you has got a desire? You've seen maybe people ministering in the Spirit, and you're like, how do they do that? I want to do that too. They pray, and people maybe fall over, people heal, whatever the case may be. Come on. We can be honest. But if we want to move in the Spirit, there's a couple of revelations that we, that we need to get. And I want to encourage you to become someone that can minister in the spirit become someone that can move that but what does it mean to minister in the spirit because sometimes uh, you know we struggle to work it out we try to figure it out you know what does it really mean how do we understand it and maybe you've seen some people do that where they pray and people fall over um, under the spirit or the anointing or some people some of them are really spiritual they fly a couple of rows all right and maybe you know you say is that real is that genuine? Is that the Lord or, or not? You know, who, who, who's that? Maybe you've seen some miracles take place and you wonder, you know, when am I going to pray for the sick? When am I going to lay hands on them and they're going to start healed? When is it my turn? You see, look at your hands. Look at your hands. Come on. There's millions of miracles within your hands. The question is, what do you need to do to get them out? What do you need to do to, to get them out? So what do we do? We often do the Pentecost thing, isn't it? We start to fast for three days. We, we press in. We break through. We get there early. We anoint the room. We do deliverance. We clean out the spirits and whatever we need to do. You know, all the nitty-gritty stuff. And we're ready. And, and when the people come, we start praying for them. And what happens? We build our faith. We pray. And then when people don't heal, we feel something. Now, we're not sure, you know. And now suddenly we need to do something to cope with that feeling of failure. Our prayers were not answered. And what do we do? We convince ourselves that this, what God has given us, is actually not our gift. Maybe God gave it to somebody else, you know. But there's just certain things that God gave me or, you know, didn't give me. And what we do is we stand back. And we allow other people to do certain things where God says, hey, there's, there's millions of miracles within your hands. The thing is, anything you can feel, you can serve. Anything that you cannot feel, you cannot give. But whatever you can feel, and I'll define feel now, you can serve. All right? In other words, if you can become aware of, if you can become aware of God's presence that's here, you can start ministering God's presence, isn't it? Amen? Okay, that's it. But if you cannot feel or become aware of God's presence, it's difficult to, to minister God's presence if you can't be aware of that. You see, so, so you need to go to that place and say, what can I feel? Can I, can I sense God's presence? Can I sense His Spirit? Yes. Mark that feeling, all right? That's actually how easy it is to move in the Spirit. And you need to go back to that feeling every time and say, hey, you know, anything you can feel, you can serve. But that's the thing. Is sometimes we struggle to feel or to understand what is it that we feel. Because we want God to move and say, Lord, this way. Instead of coming to a place to say, hey, Lord, you are here. Let's just become aware of what do you want to do. And then we start flowing with that. So much easier. To just do that. You see, but, but we've got a Western mindset. Our problem is here. We've got, a, we've got a mindset. And in our Western mindset, we've got this idea that God is way up there, isn't it? And our question is that if God is way up there and we way down here, 
what do we need to do now to get God down here? Because if he's way up there and we're here, how do we connect the two? You see, Hebrew people had a different mindset, different concept about God. They saw God as close as the air that we breathe. As close as the air. You see, we have it in our translations. We say this in Matthew. It's Jesus teaches us. You say, how do we pray? He says this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All right? Where's heaven? It's vague, isn't it? Where's heaven? If I ask you today now, where's heaven? How do you say where's heaven? The word father means supplier. In other words, supplier of what? Everything that I need. That's the word father. Supplier of everything that I need. So great. My supplier of everything that I need, who's in a place that I don't know how to get to. That's not the heart of the father, is it? So, so where's heaven? in a place we have never been to. It's hard to have a relationship because we said it's relational. It's hard to have a relationship with somebody if you don't know how to find him. True? So, so how does it work? My father, is, my father is in heaven, you know? So supplier. This is how we need to live. We need to, to live in this mindset that my supply who is from heaven. But where's heaven? If my supplies from heaven, the question is, okay, what do I need to do to call it down from heaven so that it can come now? But what Jesus is actually saying is this is heaven. We translate it wrong. The word that he uses is the plural, hieronos, which means heavens, which they translate as, as the air that I breathe. That makes it easier because now what Jesus is saying is, my father, my supply of everything that I need, that is as close as the air that I breathe. Come on, take a deep breath. Huh? That's how close the Father is. You see, we have this Western mindset because we think thoughts. Hebrew, they feel thoughts. That's our problem is we think too much thoughts. And, and so now we, we struggle to relate because it's such a distance. But he says this, ha, as close as the air that I breathe. So the supply of everything that I need, that is as close as the air that I breathe. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, the word is hagiatso, which means this, to render, to acknowledge, or to become aware of. To render, acknowledge. So in other words, my supply of everything that I need, that is as close as the air that I breathe, I acknowledge, or I become aware of that. I become aware of you, that's my supply, and it's here. It's not far-fetched. It's not there. You see, it's here, but, but we think that we have to do all these things before we justified and before we're ready. You need, so, so God says, as close as the air that I breathe, I become aware, hallowed be thy name. What is the name? The word says in, in um, Psalm 3, uh, 103, it says, bless the Lord, O my, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, bless his holy name bless the lord all my soul and do not forget his benefits you see there's so much benefits in the name of jesus so so we become aware of jesus what jesus as your savior jesus as your peace jesus as your healer when you become aware of that and you start sensing that's what god has for this moment you can start ministering that that's how easy it is Become aware of his name. And Jesus said this thing. He says, hey, whenever you gather together and you cause my name to be remembered, I will be there and I will bless you. Bless the Lord. So whatever. I love it. The word bless is benediction. And, and, and have you heard when I was in Congo once and then they called me and say, okay, come and do. They speak in French and it's a little bit of benediction. And I, I just got it. Okay. We do the blessing now afterwards. But benediction means this is to call as finished that what happened, to conclude that was just happened in a service as finished. So if you say, I bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless his holy name, his name entails everything. That's why Jesus say to his disciples, hey, I have manifested his name to you. I've manifested, to, to manifest the name, it means you, everything that his name entails, you have to be that. And he says, I have manifested the name of the Father to you. I've manifested His name. 
A name is a prophetic utterance of character who he is. So when you call upon the name, he says, when you bless it, it means that whatever his name entails, the name above all names, your healer or your, your provision or whatever, he says, when you bless it, it means that you call that as finished over your life. That what you call into remembrance. And when you bless his name, God says, I'll come, I'll be there, and I will be with my presence and I will bless you. So won't God, when we call upon his name and become aware of him as our healer, come and bless and manifest the healing? True? Don't just say that. Something you need to believe in your heart as well. You see, so is your provision, your righteousness, your sanctification, whatever. The supply is as close as the air that you breathe. And that's what we need to understand, that God is close. It's not far. It's not far. It's so important. You see, unless we try to live and minister in the Spirit, if you don't understand that God is as close as the air that you breathe, you're going to spend your time and your energy and everything you've got in order for God to come. You're going to say, God, come. God, come. We pray that. Lord, just come. Come today. Come down. Hey, where did God go? Where did God go? If He says, I will never leave nor forsake you. There's certain things sometimes that we say, Lord, come. And I understand our heart. I understand what we're trying to say. But, but where did God come? All right, because the word says that Christ has fused his spirit to our spirit. He's there. So sometimes we, we pray things, and, and this is what we need to understand. God's already in you, and he likes being there. But sometimes we struggle with that concept. We, 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 we struggle with that thought. God's not just in you. God's comfortable in us. He enjoys being in you. And somehow we think that our flesh is repulsive to God, and, you know, um, God is greater than that. God is greater than that. Praise God. God likes being in you. You see, Jesus say, people will look this way and that way looking for the kingdom. But God says, hey, the kingdom is within us. The kingdom is within you. All right? You're not going to find it any other way. God's kingdom is within you. And he says, and you're going to spend hours trying to look up and down, chasing things, looking for the anointing, going from one conference to the next and to the next and to the next. And God says, hey, God is in you. He enjoys being in you. He likes it there. Let's say it this way. God wants to be in you despite you. God wants to be in you despite you. And this is where we're going to get to the punch of tonight and go deeper. All right? I love this. The book of Exodus. Who of you have read through the book of Exodus before? Great. Good. So there's all these miraculous things happening in the book of Exodus, isn't it? Blood turning into, or water turning into blood, and, and all these things. You've got frogs turning up and boils and all these miracles and all these plagues and all these things happening. All right? Angels showing up, killing the firstborn sons. Moses raising his staff on the Red Sea split. I must say, I saw a clip someone sent me this week. And there's this Bible student reading the Bible, and he's like, praise God, and everything is reading in the book of Exodus 14. And one of the professors come, and he's like, what are you so excited about? And he's like, wow, God did a miracle. You know, he split the Red Sea, and he made a way, and they, they walked on dry ground. And you know, the professor is a bit skeptical. He's like, yeah, you know, um, you know, some scholars say, you know, that, that actually the water was like five inches deep at that time. You know, it's not really that great a miracle for, for God to split the sea and do all of that. And he sits and he thinks a little bit. And there he goes again. It's like, praise God, wonderful, hallelujah. And it's like, what's it now? He says, man, it was such a miracle that God could drown the whole nation of Pharaoh in five inches of water. All right, praise God. All right, so you have all these miracles in the book of Exodus. But remember now that, that when we look at the book of Exodus, and we need, to, we need to sum it up and we say, what's Exodus all about? Exodus is actually a wedding proposal. A proposal where, where God proposes to His people. A wedding proposal. And that's, that's how you break it up in one sentence. A proposal to a group of people. And remember, when you're a Jew, when you're Hebrew, you think like a, 
you think like a Hebrew. You've got a Hebrew mind. And as I said, Hebrews, they read the Bible not for content. They read the Bible for identification. Who I am in the story. Identification. So, so sometimes we read for context and content and all these things. But they understand it in identification. So when we look at the, the book of Exodus, and, and, and that's obvious who we are. All right, because now you need to put on that little Jew cap, okay? Think like a Jew for a moment. Some of you already have that little place for that, okay? Think like a Jew at this moment, that, that who are you in this place? In other words, you are the, the nation. You are the one that is a slave. You are enslaved, and you've got a lot of slave drivers in your life. You've got this oppression, and, and you're crying out to God, and and. God comes to rescue now because He hears you cry and your suffering and all these things. So that's who we are, right? You identify. That's, that's who we are in the story. We are a slave nation now under slave drivers. I mean, you've got a lot of slave drivers in your life, keeping you oppressed, pressing you down. You're crying out for freedom. And God shows up and He rescues you to make you His own people. He comes to say, hey, I'm going to fetch you now to be my own. That's who you are in the story, the book of, of Exodus. Now, now there's, there's things that I want to explain. In, in, in a Hebrew marriage, there's always five steps. There's five steps in, in every single Hebrew wedding that will take place. When these five steps are happening, then you know what's coming, all right? And we find it in the book of Exodus. So this is the point. God's in you, and He enjoys being in you. Say that. God enjoys being in me. You see, God's comfortable, comfortable being in you. There's, there's no place on earth that He would rather be than to be with you and me. That's where He wants to be. That's, that's His heart. And, and step one, to walk and minister in the Spirit, we need to get past our heads, this thinking thing, and we need to start feeling as well. Remember Greek people, that's us, we're not Jews. We, f we think thoughts. Hebrew people feel thoughts. They feel. All right, so for a Greek-minded person, which is all of us, it's, it's, it's so possible, you know, we can memorize the doctrine of forgiveness and still feel guilty. Isn't it? I can preach to you because we don't feel our thoughts. We think our thoughts. And it's possible for us to think that we are forgiven, but when you walk out here, you still feel guilty. True? And that's not what God wanted. Jesus died so that you can be forgiven and walk out here and feel set free. You see, so we need to feel set free as well. Not just think that we are, but still feel guilty when we walk outside. So Exodus, you, you've got a bunch of Hebrew people and you don't have to tell Hebrew people what's going on because it's their tradition. It's their way. They know what's coming. If, if you have these words, they know, hey, something's up. Something's coming. And when they saw these words, they knew what was coming. So here's the five words, all right? Five steps to Hebrew marriage is one is laka. Second is segula. Then three is mikva. Four is katuba. And then five is hopa. This is the five things that the whole time, see some of you smile. <laughs> All right, it's not that hopa, okay? Good. <laughs> These five things repeat themselves the whole time. All right. Now, in Exodus 6, we find something interesting. Here we find God speaking to the Israelites, and they say this, hey, they say, remember now, we read for identification, who we are in the story. So, so you, you, you were caught in slavery, and now you were crying out to God. He comes to save you, and He comes to rescue and take you out. So it's not just about them. It's now about us for today. We're all on that page. Good. It's about us. So, so let's read Exodus 6, verse 6. And this is something that happens. He says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Exodus 6 verse 7, he says, 
and I will take. That word take is the first word, laka. The Hebrew word laka. Remember? Marriage talk. So here's the first indication of, hey, I've got plans. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you from out under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will take you, laka. In other words, laka was the part of the relationship where, where you look to your love and you say, hey, baby, I want you to be mine. All right? It's not just this. It's not, it's not like a friend in I want you to be mine. There's something more. That's what it says. Laka is, I want you to be mine. You see, every relationship that gets to marriage gets to this point where you say to someone, I want you to be mine. That's Exodus 6. And then the next one is found in Exodus 19. See, sometimes it's so difficult because it's written over such an expand that we struggle to connect the dots often. But Exodus 19 verse 5, he says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. The word treasured possession is the second word, segula. Another translation says prized possession. So what he says actually is, hey, from everyone, I want you to be mine. And not just that you want to be mine, but you're going to be my prized possession. You're going to be my treasured possession. You're going to be the most important person in my life. That's what he says. All right? It's going to be only you and me. I want you to be mine. And out of all the earth, I chose you. You are my prized possession. Say gula. All right, and then Exodus 19, 10, we find the third one. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments. So the word wash, one of the translations is mikvah, which is a washing ritual, where they had to go physically and wash and cleanse and prepare. But understand again, you don't have to explain the Jews, the Hebrew people, when they hear this language, what do they hear? Marriage talk. Hey, there's something happening. They're like, laka? Uh, say, wait a minute. Is there marriage coming? Laka? They know this. You, you want me to be yours? I mean, this is wedding talk. God, yes, I want you to be mine. That's why I come. I want you to be mine. And I don't just want you to be mine. I'm going to make you my prized possession. That's who you are, my prized possession. God found you. He saved you. You were a slave, all right? You were in a horrible spot in your life. You were in a place with a lot of slave drivers. Can you feel the emotion? Remember, you need to identify this is who you are. There's a lot of slave drivers. You're in oppression, and God saves you, redeems you. He comes to rescue you. Not only saves you, but He redeems you. And He says, I want you to be mine and you're going to be my pre tre treasured possession. And this is something amazing because He says, not only want, I want you to be the most important person or, or make me the most important person in, in your life, if I'm not willing to make you the most important person in my life too. That's what he says. And then he says, mikvah, that would be the washing. He says, you found me. He says, you saved me. And you washed me. Is that not the work of salvation? Jesus came to save us and to wash us, to cleanse us. So we get laka. We get segula, mikvah. And the next thing we find is the katuba. All right, what's the ketubah? Ketubah is this. It says, this is the part in the wedding where we need to come to agreement. A marriage contract. Similar to our labola negotiations where we negotiate. So, so a ketubah, for a lack of a better word, is like a prenup. Prenup where we, we draw a, up a contract. And basically what it was is, um, if we're going to get married, 
then the bride and the groom will get their families together and we sit down and we draw up this ketubah. And, and she will put in this ketubah whatever she wanted in that. And me and my family, I will put into the ketubah whatever I wanted in that. So as long as the end of the day, we just all agree upon this. All right? Responsibilities of, of each other and things like the, the, the bride price, you know, or how big the diamond should be. All those things. Some of you are heavy maintenance. All those things. So, so all of that is negotiated and, and put into the ketubah. So that's the ketubah as long, remember, as we agree upon it. And then we would sign the ketubah. Now, now, if we were married and we broke the ketubah, that was called marital unfaithfulness. If we broke the ketubah, and you were not allowed to break the ketubah. The only way to restore the ketubah is if we were intimate again. Intimacy seals the deal. That restored the covenant to be intimate. And, and, and so, so once the ketubah was signed, who can I borrow? All right. Once the ketubah was signed, so say she, uh, she's now the, the bride and I'm the groom, all right? I would go and I will stand up and we will face one another and I will, I will take this ketubah and I say, hey, if, if I give her the ketubah and I say, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, you may also be. Does that sound familiar? That was the proposal, all right? And she say, when will you come back to receive me yourself? And then I'll respond and say, I don't know the day or the hour. But when my father has approved of the wedding chamber, I shall come. He will send me that I can receive you back to myself, that you can be where I am. That was what we said, you know, what we, what we will say. That, that, that's what happened. And I will go and I will make the wedding chamber, right? And, and then I'll come back and you have to be ready. You have to be ready that I can fetch you. And I will come back to the place where I've made the ketubah and the wedding chamber and then we will go and we'll have a wedding. And, and what happens is now, remember now the last part we said is the hopa. So the hopa is in the wedding chamber, at the bed, it's four stakes in the ground. And it's like a talus, a prayer shawl. You remember that thing that they put over then? Similar to that. It speaks of similar as the veil, but it, it was a covering. So that, that covering will be over the bed. And what happens is that, that that represented the Holy of Holies. The place of God's glory. And of God's presence. So the wedding bed is covered with God's glory. It's covered with God's presence. And remember what we said? Intimacy seals the deal. So it was in the presence of God that it was sealed. So we will go in to the wedding press in the, in the presence of God. The marriage guests, will, they will walk the husband and wife to that place. They will wait outside, you know, talking about pressure. All right? They were not married yet. All right? They, they went through all wedding and they had to sign the ketubah. But they were not married yet. They will take them to the door and they will see him catch up the bride. That's where we get some of that, the rapture. He will take up his bride and take her through the door into the wedding bed. And they will wait outside. It was covered while the intimate, in the presence, the glory, the hopa of God. Then intimacy seals the deal. They will come out and the wedding feast will start. So all of this had happened where we start reading the story of the wedding at Cana. All of this had taken place now. Now they're going to party. All right. So back to, back to Exodus. We've got Laka, Segula, Mikva, and they know what's coming. The Ketubah contract so Exodus 19 we've got mikvah Exodus 20 we've got the, 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 the ketubah that shows up 
What do we find in Exodus 20? Hey? Ten Commandments. We call it Ten Commandments. It was actually not Ten Commandments. It, it was actually a ten-step katuba. Ten-step. You know, we need to quit thinking of the Ten Commandments of conditions for God to love us. I have to do this and this and this in order for Him to love me. God said, hey, you don't come to the place of a katuba unless there's love. You don't come to this place, you know. So he says, hey, stop thinking of this is what you need to do in order for me to love you. All right? This is a proof I propose that I already do. I already love you so much more. You see, so, so what happens is we become so sin conscious. Even when we minister in the Spirit. If we can just understand that I don't have to do stuff for God to love me. God loves you, despite you. The katuba was proof of it. God loves us. You don't get into a katuba without love. You cannot get to that place. That was the love of God. God was proposing to a group of people because He loved them. Not telling them, this is what it takes to love you. It was a wedding proposal. Listen, listen to this. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. Right. That makes sense, doesn't it? If we're going to get married, it's going to be you and me. Not other gods, other people. It's going to be me, you and me. You're not going to have other people come in between us. I have to be your number one. That's what God says. Number two, he says, you're not going to carry or make any graven image or likeness or anything in heaven or earth. In other words, what he says is, if we're going to be married, what? You're not going to carry pictures of your old boyfriends or girlfriends in your wallet. You're not going to do that. It's you and me. He says, you're not going to use my name in vain. Sometimes we, 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 in other words, what he says is, if we're going to be married, you're going to have the legal right to put my name on something. And you're not going to use my name in vain. You're not going to put my name on something that I will not put my name on. It's got nothing to do with saying, oh my God, all those things. He says, no, you're not going to sign up because you're going to carry my name. You're not going to use my name on something that I won't put my name on also do it. He says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. In other words, hey, if we're going to be married one day in seven, it's just going to be you and me. It's date nights. That's where date nights come from. Date nights. It's going to be you and me. Keep it holy. All right, so this was the, this was the ketubah. Are you still okay? All right. Still fine. Right? What happens after a ketubah is once we both made a ketubah and I stand here, what do we need to do? Hey? We need to sign it. You need to sign it. All right? Once the ketubah was made, I had to sign it. And I give and I say, will you marry me? And she signs the ketubah. So what happens in Exodus 20, verse 18, we have God giving the ketubah and He says this, I propose to you and I say, will you sign it? So what is good manners? If I ask and I propose and I say, will you marry me? What do you need to do? You don't have to say yes. There needs to be a response. At least. Because in this instance, they didn't say yes. They said no. Look at what they said. They said, verse 18, Exodus 20, 18, it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. So tonight we speak on baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you a life that's being filled with the power of God a life that is drained of yourself and filled with His power the Spirit, that was God's heart from the beginning 
Remember Adam and Eve? We had the kingdom. We lost the kingdom. What happened? We were unholy. The spirit departed. God poured out His spirit again. There's something that God wanted to give. He says this. They saw three things. Let's just take it step by step. They saw three things. Thunder and flashes of lightning. The sound of a trumpet and billows of smoke. All right. How do you... Or let's just say that. So you've got Laka, Segula, Mikva. The Ketubah has come. God has given now the Ten Commandments. The people are standing at the base of the mountain. What happens? They look up and the Hopa appears. The glory of God covers the mountain. Remember the glory, the Hopa over the wedding bed is that that's where intimacy seals the deal. So, so they saw thunder and light. How do you see thunder? The writer knows the word year because he says, and then second, they heard trumpets. So he's not confused. He says they saw thunder and they heard trumpets and billows of smoke. So how do you see thunder? When you look at the concordance, the strong concordance, the word for thunder here is kulei, kulei. And it's translated as this. So they look up and they see what? Kulei means languages of fire. Languages of fire. And lightning says, especially like flashing swords. Flashing swords. What do we say? What's the word? Our sword. Right? They saw languages of fire and flashing swords. Glorified fire. The, the fire that they speak is the same that Moses, when God calls him and it's the, the bush, the burning bush, he says, let me go and see why is this bush not burning up? It's glorified fire. Same words used here. Languages of glorified fire and flashing swords. That's what, is, what they see, all right? And, and they see these voices inside the fire. And what do these voices say? And it's interesting. People will say it need to be soft. It says, and that sound became louder and louder and louder and louder. But what does the voices say? The voices say this, hey, will you marry me? Remember what he says? Laka. Segula, Mekva, Katuba, the Hopa comes. And he takes this and he says, hey, will you marry me? And there's just one thing that needs to come now. And this is the respond back. They need to say, yes. They need to respond. But what happens? They didn't. Verse 19 says, but the people were afraid and they trembled and they stood far off. How many of us are sometimes afraid of the Holy Spirit because it's too spooky? We don't understand it and we rather just chuck it because, oh, he said I can't use that name. Um, we just throw it away, you know, because of what we don't understand. And he says, and they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. You know what happened here? They didn't think. They can measure up to God. And God had to, to relegate himself back from that point on where God wanted to give tongues of fire. What happens? He spoke to the people in dreams and visions. Dreams and interpretations. Visions and, and interpretations. From that day on, what happens? They had to come back here by year and have the feast of Pentecost the feast of Pentecost the feast of weeks and at the feast of Pentecost what they had to do this is the only time in the Bible what they had to do because all the other times they had to do the other way they had to come feast of Pentecost and take leavened bread what does leaven represent sin Jesus says a little leaven leavens the whole lump with Passover, just before, because that, they didn't understand the atonement and what Christ was about to do. And he says, go and make unleavened bread. 
even played this game where the mom hides the leaven and they had to seek for it and take it out because there can be no sin. And they had to eat the whole Passover lamb. So unleavened bread the whole time. But with the Feast of Pentecost, God says you bring leavened bread to the priest. They had to bring leaven, not unleavened. It was the only time. And they will bring leavened bread to the priest. And the priest will do something like this. They will lift the leavened bread up to God. And they will say something like this. Thank you, Father, that you are willing to mix your unleavened life with our leavened lives. And they will take and they will tear the bread in two. And they will take oil. Oil is a symbol of what? Holy Spirit. And they will pour it through the bread until it's saturated. And then they will say, now the day of Pentecost had fully come. Thank you, Father, that you're willing to mix your unleavened life with our leavened lives. That you're willing to become one with us. I mean, a little, a little, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, isn't it? All of us are saved, isn't it? Hey, but how many of us are still issues? How many of us are really perfect? I almost said all of us. All of us have still issues, isn't it? And sometimes a little leaven in your life makes you look leaven. He will take that bread, open it up, pour the oil through the Holy Spirit, and He will saturate the bread. And He'll say that now the day of Pentecost had fully come. So what happens? One day, thousands of years later, there's this group of people, they celebrate Pentecost because this was the thing to do. Year by year, they had to do it. So, so they're doing the thing that they are told to do. We have to have the Feast of Pentecost. Something happens. The priest takes the bread. He, he raises the bread. He lifts it up. He fills it with oil. And he says, hey, now the day of Pentecost had fully come. But this time something different happens. You see, the people know the story of their forefathers, how they stood at the base of the mountain and how the glory appeared, how God came and proposed and said all these things. And they know how their people have rejected God and His proposal, that they chosen a different path. They were covered by the glory. You were made for God's glory. They were covered by the glory. They saw the tongues of fire. They heard the sound of a trumpet, but still they rejected God. And what happens this time? In the book of Acts 2, when the priest lifts that bread and he says, Now the day of Pentecost had fully come when they were all together in the upper room. And when they look up, the room fills with what? Smoke, the hope of the glory of God appears again. What do we find? Again, the tongues of fire appear. The glorified fire. And they see these tongues burning over their heads. And you can go and look. You can go and double check me. Triple check me. I double dare you. Okay. The word that speaks there and says the tongues of fire speaks of that fire and the flashing swords. Again. That time God wanted to baptize His people with the fire of God. Say, let's become one again. But they rejected it. And here in Acts 2, it appears, the glory comes. And the tongues of fire appear. And they hear the sound, and this, this like a rushing wind. And what, is, what do these tongues say? What, what's the tongue saying? says the same message let us become one will you marry me the only difference is this time they spoke back they responded they were filled and they spoke back in tongues they responded this time they answered why the bride of Christ I want to marry you they became the bride of Christ and they responded back and said yes you see, this is, this is a huge paradigm shift. I know for us, sometimes as Burkis, we struggle. Because in the Old Testament, they could see that. 
And they could interpret dreams, interpretation. Visions, interpretation. But now, because God is in us, we can speak and interpret. That what they only could see, we can speak. We can say, we can release. We've got tongues and interpretation. We have the ability to speak that what they only could see. It's a huge paradigm shift. It's different. Because for many years we were taught this. Unfortunately, we were taught this. And remember, this is not a ticket to sin. But we were taught you have to get rid of all the leaven in your life to be used by God. You have to get rid of all the leaven in your life to be used by God. The whole point of Pentecost is this. God wants to marry you, leaven and all. The Holy Spirit, He will cleanse us. He will wash us. But we have this thing that our flesh is so repulsive to God. And how does God want to be one with us? How does He want to be in us? The whole point of Pentecost is that oil flows through leaven. Oil flows through leaven beings. God wants to use you. That's why He says, walk in the Spirit. And then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But we want to do this. Stop all. Stop doing this. First be good. And then start walking in the flesh. Ach, walking, in the, walking in the spirit. And God says, ah, start walking in the spirit. Then you will stop. Because that's the thing. Oil flows through heaven life. God's in you and he enjoys it. There's no place it would rather be than be in you. you. See, God chose to fuse himself to your spirit. The thing is, God wants. So, so, so baptism in tongues and fire and all these things is not just a lame excuse to say, hey, that's the sign of having the Holy Spirit. There's so much more depth of what God wanted to do with the purpose of, of having tongues and respond back. You are the bride of Christ. There's something that God wants to, to ignite. There's a, there's a fire. When you carry and when you speak this, you see, God, God comes and does things that's far above what we could think. God is as near you as the air that you breathe. God is as close. You see, don't look for the kingdom there and there and there. It's in you. The question tonight is this. If God comes with His glory and His fire and He proposes to you, and he says, hey, will you marry me? The question is, will you respond and speak back? Will you answer the call? Will you come back and say, yes, Lord? 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit lives inside of you. That temple is holy. You see, in, in, in the Old Testament, they were told that if you touch something unclean, you become unclean. Jesus comes and he touches the lepers and he heals them. He comes and shows us something different. Ezekiel sees the vision of the river that flows from the temple, from the inside out. And it says that we are the temple. John says from your belly will flow rivers of living water. From your belly from your innermost parts will flow rivers of living water. You are God's temple. And, and Ezekiel says that from this place where the river flows from the inside of the temple, in the Old Testament, if you touch something unclean, you become unclean. There was a ritual to become clean. He says, now, I'm about done. Now, because the river flows out, he says, where the river goes, wherever it goes and it touches, it restores desert becomes green and lush. He says there's levels, ankle deep, knee deep. He says it's such a place where we come so deep that I could not stand, I was swimming. See, God wants to take you into His Spirit. It's not spooky, it's not weird. That's the fullness of God that He wants for you. God designed you for that. 
God wants to be in you in that fullness. Don't let this Greek mind keep you out of the way. Don't allow this to be the stronghold. That's why he says, you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Come on, it's Christ to baptize us. He says, it's beneficial for me to go away, that I can send the helper, the comforter, the one that will walk alongside you. He says, John spoke and said about John being baptizing with water, but I will come and I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit does so much. I just want to tell you tonight that the Holy Spirit is far more than just being evidence of speaking in tongues. He desires an intimate relationship with you. God wants to be in you and He likes being there. I want to invite you to receive that fullness, to take that what the Lord wants and to live that out for His glory too. Do not just take that, but let the river start flowing from you. Let the river start releasing from your spirit so that where you are, the valleys can become green and lush and restore the lepers being healed, people refreshed. Then that's that thing that I don't have to say, come, come, Lord, come, Lord, come. He says, no, Lord, you are here. Let it flow. Let it flow. John 17, Jesus says, Father, the glory that you've given me, now I give to them. God has given His glory to us. We need to release it. Amen. Come on, let's just, let's just be in God's presence. Do we need to pray? Do we need to break and then minister? Or do we need to flow? What do we need to do? Are you okay? Do you need to go to the toilet? Then maybe you can run out and come back and we continue. Do we want to pray for people. I think who wants to be filled with that spirit. Maybe first for those who don't have a tongue at all, who can't speak in tongues. Remember, your mind is unfruitful. It's your spirit that prays. It's, it's, it's responding. Remember, the bride of Christ was birthed. It's you speaking to your, to your bridegroom, to the groom. It's a response back. It's something that God pursues of relationship for you. So much deeper than just babbling words that you don't understand. And I want to tell you, the more you do that, the more hungry you get. The more desire for God you have. The more you say, hey. So you have to get past your mindset and past this thing that blocks us and say, Lord, it's you and me. Speak to God. Speak to Him. Respond back. Not Afrikaans, not English, not other your heavenly language, your way to communicate with the lover of your soul. God wants to fill you. Are you ready to receive that? Some say yes and others is like, stay with words, like, okay. <laughs> You're gonna be safe. You're gonna be okay. God's after you. He wants to display something in your life, but He wants to shift you. God doesn't want to leave you the same. God wants the fullness. Remember what we do. It's not just tongues. It's a manifestation. It's, it's, it's languages of glorified fire, flashing swords. It's something supernatural. Glorified fire, man. God's equipping you to, to do certain things in the spirit and to be able to, to pray, counter the enemy, to confuse him so much. God has given you so much. Luke 11, he says, if earthly fathers who are bad, if they know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more will the heavenly Father not give you if you ask of the Holy Spirit? God wants to give you. It's really, he says, I will send you the promise of the Father. It's a promise. You will. So no, not one of you is disqualified. Not one of you cannot receive that. As I said, it's not for some, oh, it's only for that part or only for this. No, it's for everyone. Why? Because you were a slave. God came to save you, 
rescue you, to wash you, to cleanse you, and to say, I want you to be mine. It's a personal invitation to each and every one of us. Amen. Is there like a ministry team that can help? Are there people of, I want to just be in, in order with the rules of the house here as well. So I don't know if there's other things that need to take place as well. Bedieningspan kan voor hem te kom. Dankie Santa. Kom maar bedien. I think we can start with people maybe who, who cannot speak in tongues at all. Who, who wants to desire the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you want to be filled, you can come to the front and we're going to pray for you. And then if you want a fresh filling, if you want an impartation of God's power, then after that we'll start praying and, and we'll just minister and release that. It's okay. So it's the two invitations. The one is first for those who wants to get baptized, has never received that yet. We'd love to pray for you. And then, as Pastor Voter has said, you know, let's see if, they're going to feed you lunch tomorrow or not. <laughs>